it is kind of like other holidays. We've, we've watered it down and we say happy 4th of July. It's Independence Day. And so let's change our words this week when we tell people happy 4th of July. Let's change it to what? Happy Independence Day. What a blessing we have as Americans, as United States citizens, to celebrate Independence Day. And I'd like for us to really teach our children it's not the 4th of July holiday, it's Independence Day. And know the history of that. We are studying the book of Haggai. And believe it or not, we're on the last lesson of the book of Haggai. And today, the last four verses, we will be looking at the Great Tribulation and the Millennial Kingdom. And you don't even realize that if you just read through it real fast so that you can say, I've read Haggai. But there are some words in those verses that are a hint to us. It's not a hint. That, that are the indicator to us that this is referring to the Great Tribulation. Daniel, in, in the sequence of events, has already taught the Jews about the Great Tribulation and about the Millennial Kingdom. And so Haggai now is reinforcing that using the days that ha the words that Haggai used because he assumed that his people understood it. So we're going to look at that today. It is a wonderful, wonderful passage. So what I would like for us to do is to remember a little bit about Haggai. Okay. Um, his name means what? Festival. Festival. So that's really kind of an interesting fact for us to remember and we've talked about that several times but we just want to go back just a little bit to remember what we've learned about Haggai. Haggai is the author of the book of what? Haggai. He was one of the three post-exilic prophets, meaning there were three prophets after the exile and he was one of those three. It's not working. Lyndon. Lyndon. No, it's not working. Haggai gave how many? Oh, he and Zechariah were called the what? Temple. Temple prophets. Haggai gave five messages within four months. He wrote from September the 1st to December the 24th in 520 B.C. And that's going to be important for us to remember because it's been 16 years now that the people have quit building the temple. And so he's writing this book to them and he's encouraging them to rebuild the temple. So listen, when you read the book of Haggai, read it in light of his encouragement to the people to do what God has told them to do, and that's to rebuild the temple. Uh, who was the king of Persia during this time? Darius. Good, very good, Darius. Um, the work on the construction of the temple had ceased for how many years? 16. And due to his encouraging words, the people immediately began to rebuild the temple. And so... Uh, the people had begun work on the temple. The book of Haggai contains many of the principles of the New Testament. And I'm going to go back and show you what those are in a moment. And finally, today, we're going to see, and this is so exciting, you see, because this is one of the most important prophecies about the Messiah in the tiny, dusty book of Haggai. Because he tells them uh, a new clue as to how to identify the Messiah when he comes. The people in Israel, when Jesus came, did not recognize him. And you know why? They didn't know the scriptures. Because had they known the book of Haggai, they would have studied a little bit more about this man who called himself the Messiah. And they would have looked at his genealogy to see if he met the criteria for the Messiah. 
did you know that the Bible is very clear to the Jews and to you and me? This is a way to identify the Messiah. You look at his genealogy and there are certain criteria that that man must meet. So we're going to look at this and see if Jesus actually met the criteria for being the Messiah. And here's what's really wonderful to me. If God said something 500 years before Jesus was born, and he said, look for these things in the Messiah, and it actually came about, what does that tell us about God's word? It's true. He can be trusted. So we need to know the scriptures. It's so important to know the scriptures. And it is so important to know the Old Testament. Because if you don't know the Old Testament, you will not recognize the Messiah. And when we get into Zechariah, he told more about Jesus the Messiah than any other prophet about his first coming. So it's going to be so exciting to read the next book of prophecy, starting next week perhaps, the book of Zechariah. But Haggai tells us that Zerubbabel becomes the center of the Messianic line. That's interesting, isn't it? So we're going to look at this. And who was Zerubbabel, by the way? The governor. How many of you knew that before six months ago? We never heard of him, did we? Didn't really care. <laughs> and we read about him in the book of Ezra, but we learn more about him in the book of Haggai than we ever learned in the book of Ezra, in the history book. So we're going to look at this today. I want my other clicker. All right, the first four messages of Haggai. Haggai gave five messages in four months. These are the messages that he taught. I want you to think about these in light of rebuilding the temple, okay? That that's, was the contemporary context of this book. Then we see, do, does that principle apply to us? The first message, Linda and I want the other one, is Haggai 1, 1 through 11. And the theme is, first things first, no more excuses. What did that mean in light of rebuilding the temple? Kathy, put God, first. put God first in relation to what? The building, of the, temple. the building of the temple. They said it's not time to build the temple. It's been 16 years. Haggai says it's time. And he says, so no more excuses. And then the second one is that God said, I am with you. What does that mean? in light of rebuilding the temple. In spite of the adversity you might be facing or the people's, other people's discouragement. In spite of the other discouragements of all the people, God said it this way. decided to follow my instructions and be obedient to what I've told you to do. Remember, I am with you. So we really must be obedient to the Word of God. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Honey, is it on? Okay, let me try getting it on now. This was so cool last week on our... <clears throat> I don't know how to turn it on. Oh, here it is. All right, let's see if this works. Yay! Um, by the way, how many of you watched the YouTube video that Chase did for us. I went on and I looked at it. It was 25 views. Made me feel so happy. Tell all your friends we can double our class this week because they can go online and Google YouTube and look for our lessons. It's on your newsletter. Thank you, Chase. The third message that Haggai gave, first one was, first things first. Second one, when you are following me, I will be with you. The third one is be strong. He says be strong. Now that means to be true to the instructions and the word of God. And then he says and work. 
and then don't be afraid. Aren't these beautiful messages to the people? They were wanting to follow God now. He said, be strong, work on what? Work where? On the temple and don't be afraid. How many of you have been called not to build a temple but to do something for God? Every hand ought to be up. Every hand. Every one of us today is in the place that God wants us to be because you're here. And tomorrow you have your things to do. That's what God has called you to do. And that is when you are to be strong and obedient to him to do your work as if you were doing it for Jesus Christ and don't be afraid. And the fourth message is a people with sin in their heart cannot accomplish the holy work of God, nor can he bless them. He was saying examine your hearts because if there is sin in your life or in your heart, you cannot do the holy things of God. He said you cannot mix holy with the unholy and come out holy. Did you know that? You cannot compromise the things of the world with the things of God and come out holy. You cannot do those kinds of things, the work of God, with any kind of sin in your life. So we have to be very careful and examine our lives and make sure that we are true to the things of God. So that's the first four um, lessons that he gave them. And today we're looking at the last four verses of Haggai and it's referring to Governor Zerubbabel and God chose him to wear the signet ring. Isn't that exciting? Let's find out what that means. Here's the signet ring that the kings wore. When the, king, uh, the kings of Judah had a ring and it was called the signet ring. The base word of the word signet is sign. It's a sign of the authority and the power of God that he gave to the king. And when he used that ring and he sealed uh, either a clay on, on an envelope or there, he would put his signet ring into the clay of a, of a document, if that ring signet was there, if that symbol was there, that was the authority of the king. And in Judah, a king had the authority and the power of God. What a responsibility. And when you read the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you're going to see that most of those kings abused that power, did not recognize that power, violated that power. They were not obedient to the word of God. So that was what the signet ring was, and Zerubbabel, a seemingly insignificant man, was chosen to wear the signet ring. But he didn't get to wear it for a long, long time. In fact, he never wore it because it was promised to his descendant. And we will find that. Now, when you read the Bible, and then before we studied Ezra and Haggai, we didn't really know anything about this man Zerubbabel. He seems very insignificant, unimportant, and he was just a governor. But yet God put him in the center of the messianic line. And he said, I am ch I've chosen you to be my signet ring. So we're going to find out what all that means. And here's the verse. I will make you like a signet ring. He's telling that to Zerubbabel. On my finger, says the Lord, for I have chosen you. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. That is the last word of Haggai. God says, I have spoken. That's the last words that we'll find in the book of Haggai. So let's go ahead and look at this message. It's a revelation of God's program for his people. You see, God has had a plan since the beginning of time for Israel. And he is telling them, quit worrying about today and look to the future. That's what he's going to tell them. This is their great hope. This is the encouragement that he gave to them. In this program that we're going to see in Haggai chapter 2, we're going to see just the hint 
of the tribulation and I'm going to teach you the three words that every time you see those words in prophecy, you will know that those three words refer to the tribulation. Anybody know those words? Okay. I'll tell you. Now, when you go home today, you're going to go through the Bible and you're going to look for all those words, all the times those words are written, and then it's going to be a key to you. This is the great tribulation. Doug, did you peek? On that day. On that day. Yes, you peeked, didn't you? <laughs> Good for you. If the words are on that day, and when it refers to that, that is the end of the tribulation but it refers to the time of the great tribulation and, and also the Lord's day. Those are the other three words. They're the same group of words on that day and the Lord's day. Now let's look at Haggai. If I open your Bibles. Let's just read it together in the scriptures because when you read your Bible, you know that when, when you're going to look for it again, you'll know what side of the page it's on. Okay? So isn't that right, Lori? Got your pink Bible. Haggai chapter 2, verse 20. This is the last message. I want you to look when it was written and to whom this last message was given. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. You will find if you look up that the fourth message was also given on December the 24th. This is the second message given on the same day the 24th day of the month. And this is what he says in verse 21. Tell Zerubbabel. So everybody look at me now. I've told you every Sunday for a long, long time now. When you read prophecy, there are two things that you must always pay attention to. What was the first one? Whom. To whom it was written. This message is right now is going to be written to whom? Zerubbabel. Not the people, not the priests, but to Zerubbabel, the governor. What was the second thing I told you that you must always look for? Not only to whom, but what was the other one? The time. The time or when? When was it written? Because if you don't know when this was written, you do not understand the prophecy at all. It, you don't understand the context. This prophecy was written in the second year of Darius. Now we know that Darius was the third king of the empire of Persia. So we understand now the context. And we know that it was written to Zerubbabel. So the word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, um, got verse 21, first part, tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. Last week we read that, didn't we? When God said, I will shake the heavens and the earth. In fact, we read it in Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. Go up there in your Bible. Go way up to Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. I will shake the sea and the dry land. What did I tell you that means when God shakes the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land? That he is in control of what? Nature. God is in control of nature. And we're going to see that he said, he, I'm going to shake the heavens and they're going to pour out all their treasures onto Judah to adorn the temple. And he shook out Persia. And they gave three times out of the royal treasury the silver and the gold to adorn the temple. I think that is so beautiful. Now here again in verse 21, he says, Tell Zerubbabel that I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. So... Looking at these two verses, verse 20, when was this last message given by Haggai? On the 24th day of the ninth month, because the message above was given in the ninth month. 
on our calendar, it's December. It's December 24th. And so his prophecies began at the beginning of the sixth month, and this is the last one, the end of the ninth month in the second year of Darius's reign. And then to whom was this message given? Zerubbabel. So let's look at page 52 on our notes. By the way, uh, Brenda last week said, you know, sh you know, uh, Chase, when you make that um, YouTube for us, it would really be helpful if, if we could just have the, mess the lesson also, the lesson page. So guess what he did? Somehow or another, he put that lesson right there on the Google YouTube page, and you can download it and print it. Is that not awesome? So I don't have to come back anymore, do I? <laughs> Y'all just go on YouTube and find my lesson every week. No, that does not mean you can stay home, okay? Because I'm much better in person than I am on Google. I mean, I really am. Um, so anyway, uh, to those people on YouTube, everybody say hello. 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 All right, page 52 and 53. I'm not going to get to 53, of course, but I want you to see how it all works together. Page 52, letter A. Okay. Roman numeral 5. That's at the top of page 52 because this is the fifth message of Haggai. It's why it's Roman numeral 5. Haggai encouraged the people to look toward a greater future when Zerubbabel was given the signet ring. It is a revelation of God's what? Program. His, what he has planned for them, for his people. And it will include the great what? Tribulation, Tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ. We're going to see that in just a moment in those few little verses. Letter A. When and to whom was this message given? Number 1, verse 20. When was it given? The 24th day, the 24th day of which month? the ninth month and all you have to do is to go back to chapter 2 verse 1 and it will tell you which month that was all right Chastain, uh -huh. I have a comment it's kind of interesting that it's December 24th but to us it's Christmas Eve mm -hmm. and so that's his birth but then he's coming back in the same time frame so you think that's significant at the 24th of December Maybe. could be Except we kind of think Jesus wasn't born on December 24th, yeah. But that's a good point. It is interesting, isn't it? Thank you, Angie. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and uh, to whom was it written? Zerubbabel, what? Zerubbabel. Governor of Judah. What's the other word for governor, by the way, that I taught you? The Persian word. Satrap. Satrap, that's right. You might want to put that in parentheses. Not satrap. <laughs> Satrap. All right, now then, oh, I love this clicker. Okay, I'm going to give you mine, Cheryl, and I'm going to keep this one, okay? <laughs> what do we know about Governor Zerubbabel? Well, let's find out a few things. I really do like reviewing Governor Zerubbabel. I was talking to this young woman, this young couple, and I said, you know, people come into this class and they, oh my gosh, I'm so behind. No, what you do in this class is you just jump in. You just jump right into it, and I'll go back. So I've been teaching about Zerubbabel for several months. But I'm going to teach him again right quick, okay? Zerubbabel, he was a nephew of the last king of Judah, Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the last king. He was captured by King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar killed his sons right in front of him and then blinded him and took him in chains to Babylon. What a terrible thing to happen. So his sons were killed, and they were the heirs to the throne, the direct heirs to the throne of Judah, but now they're dead. So the next person to be in line to be king of Judah is um, Zerubbabel in Babylon. He's living in Babylon. He's the crown prince. He was the one next in line to be king. Everybody knew that, but, of course, they didn't have kings in Judah, did they? So he was the next in line. He was an exile living in Babylon. In 539 B.C., the, day, the year that uh, Cyrus conquered Babylon, he wrote a decree and he allowed all the slaves to go home. Remember? 
And in that decree, on the Cyrus cylinder that I've shown you many times, it says that the Jews could return to Judah and the purpose is to rebuild the temple. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And he sent all that gold and silver that, ba that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from, Babylon, from, Jer from Jerusalem, from the temple, and he sent it back with Zerubbabel. He sent it back. So he returned to Jerusalem in 539 B.C., and he was the leader of the returning exiles. Read that in Ezra 1. Be sure and go back and read that this week because Zerubbabel was the leader of the exiles. He was the one who took care of all of that thousands and thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars worth of gold and silver, all of those pieces that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen. He led the people when they got back in building the altar. He was very careful to go back and to study the scriptures as to how to build that altar and how to offer the sacrifices. He, they had to go back and study the scriptures. Um, you'll read that in Ezra 2. Be sure and look at that. He laid the cornerstone of the temple. We read that in Zechariah, by the way, that he was the one who laid the cornerstone. Zechariah said Zerubbabel will also lay the capstone. Yeah, and he carried the plumb line, which meant he was the, man, the construction manager. Do you remember studying all of this? Well, now we're back to him again. Um, he was leading the rebuilding of the temple when the enemies of the Jews began to intimidate them. He was the one who told the Samaritans, no, you cannot participate in rebuilding the temple. Why? Because they worshipped other gods. They, that would have been combining the holy with the unholy. And God said, you will have no other gods before me. And they worshipped other gods as well as God Jehovah. And so Zerubbabel said, we will not compromise. And now that I've studied the rest of Haggai, I kind of even appreciate more his stand. So he uh, worked with them until they quit their work for 16 years. He was the crown prince. And when he was sent back to Judah by King Cyrus, Cyrus made him the governor of that province of Judah. Uh, according to Daniel, there were 120 provinces. Daniel 6. Daniel 6 says there were 120 provinces of the Persian kingdom Babylon was made the administrative center and Daniel was the head of all of those provinces. And the king also designated who would be the governor or the satrap of each of these provinces. And so Daniel was the head of all of that, remember, in Daniel 6? Put that in your notes too. Go back and read that. It'll make more sense to you now. Um, but he made Zerubbabel the governor or the satrap of the province of Judah. There had been no king of Judah since King Zedekiah was killed in 586 B.C. and uh, when jo Judah was defeated by Babylon. And to, to this day, there has not been a king in the line of David on the throne in Judah, has there, or in Israel, to this day. Jesus called this time the times of the Gentiles and it will end when the descendant of David sits once again on the throne. You will read about this descendant of David in, Zach in Haggai. You will read about him in Zechariah. You read about him in Isaiah. You'll read about him in Jeremiah. You read about him in the book of Daniel. It's so wonderful to read these books and to see this descendant when he will come and sit on the throne of David, but it hasn't happened yet. At his second coming, Jesus Christ, this is what we believe, okay? Listen carefully. When you want to know what you believe about Jesus, this is what we believe, that someday he's coming back and he will sit 
on the throne of David. The throne of David, as I understand it, will be in a, the temple. And he will sit on the, on the throne of David in Jerusalem, in the temple, and he will rule the whole earth as king of kings and lord of lords. That's what we believe. All righty? And we're going to read some more about that. So, when there had been kings of Judah, they wore the signet ring of whom? God. They wore the signet ring that God had given to them. It symbolized that the king had authority, honor, and power as the representative of the God of heaven. Listen carefully. Today, you and I have the Holy Spirit within us as believers in Christ. That is our signet ring. And we walk with authority and power just as Jesus Christ did because we have the seal of the Holy Spirit within us. Is that not awesome? So this is who Zerubbabel was. So let's read God's message in these verses. He gives four messages or four parts of this message to Zerubbabel. Verse 21. Well, let's go ahead and finish up uh, letter number two on letter A on page 52. Number two. To whom was it written? Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the governor of Judah. Letter A. Zerubbabel. <laughs> By the way, that means born in Babylon. You see the word Babel in there? Zerubbabel means born in Babylon. He was the crown, what? Prince, Prince of Judah. But he was named Judah. governor of the Persian province of Judah. Judah. There were 120 provinces. Each one had a governor. And what's the word for governor? Satrap. Satrap. And where do you read about that in the scriptures? Daniel, Daniel 6. Letter B, under number 2. There had been no, what? King of Judah since 586 B.C. when Babylon conquered Judah and killed her king. But I've got to change that. It really wasn't killed the king. It was took the king into exile and he spent the rest of his life in prison. So he died in prison. But he did kill his sons. Jesus called this what? Yes, the times of the Gentiles. If you want to, turn to Luke chapter 21. Because I have taught you this many times, but I've never read it to you in the scriptures. I want to show you where Jesus called this the times of the Gentiles. When Gentiles would rule Israel. All right? And really the whole world. The whole world is under the authority of Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? People who are not Jews. So in the Bible, we have the Jews and we have the Gentiles. In the Bible, Israel was ruled by God's people whom we now call Jews. It will stay that way until Jesus Christ comes again. Look at Luke 21, verse 24. And we're going to look at the last part uh, well, we'll just read all 24. They will fall by the sword. This is people in Jerusalem in the latter times. And will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Now let's think about the history of the Jews today. They have, throughout history, beginning with slavery in Egypt, they were taken into slavery and they were held under the control of the Egyptians at that time for 435 years, prisoners. And it wasn't until Moses came and said, let my people go, that God delivered his people. So they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. That's happened, hasn't it? It happened during the time of Babylon. It happened during the time of Assyria when they conquered the northern kingdom Israel. Babylon conquered the southern kingdom. And then we see uh, in Persia when, when King Artaxerxes was going to have all the people killed under Queen Esther. 
Um, then we see in Rome, when they conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took all the people to Rome. When you go to Rome today and visit the great Colosseum that there, that beautiful Colosseum, guess who built that? Jewish slaves in 70 A.D. And then we go through there and then they conquered Jerusalem over and over again. Then the Muslims came in. And now, uh, then we have Hitler. Look at what the verse says. They will fall by the sword. They have, haven't they? And they will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Has that happened? Yes. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles. Is that true? Yes. In fact, the Gentiles today of the enemies of Israel threaten them. They will not be happy until Jerusalem falls into the sea. Wow. What sea? What sea? Think of, the, think of the map, the Mediterranean Sea. That's when they'll be happy. That's when Iran leaders will be happy when Jerusalem has fallen into the sea. And Jesus says, uh, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are what? Over. Fulfilled. So listen, don't be surprised when Israel is attacked. Don't be surprised, but let me tell you something. This is what God told Abraham. He said, if anybody blesses my people, they will be what? Blessed. But if anybody hurts my people, they will be cursed. This is a warning. It's a warning by God since 2,000 years before Christ. Don't mess with God's people. He has a plan for them. So he isn't surprised that all of these things are happening. Jesus said it. It will happen until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And when have I told you that the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled? When will that happen? When Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, returns to earth. He will not return to earth as a little baby. He will not grow up and be crucified. He is going to come back as a ruler, as a judge, as the king, but not just the king. He'll be the king of all kings, and he'll be the Lord of all lords, and that's what we're looking for today. Don't be looking for the Antichrist. Be looking for Jesus. Yes, Timothy. There's, there, and the scriptures tell us that the Jews today, we think, why in the world? Don't they know the scriptures? Why in the world? But the scriptures say that they are blinded. And God will remove those blinders someday. That's in Romans chapter 9, I think. But anyway, all right. So tell Zerubbabel that I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. That means God is in... Did I finish number two? Uh, yes, I did. The times of the Gentiles will conclude... On the day when Jesus returns to earth as what? King of kings. Lord of lords. Where will his throne be located? In Jerusalem. In the new temple. Another temple. So this says God is in control of nature. Look at verse 22 in your Bible on Haggai chapter 2 verse 22. I will overturn royal thrones. So God's going to destroy the kings, isn't he? He's going to take them down. I will shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. Has he done all this? Has this happened yet? No. 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 And he says, I will. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. That's the military. You know, people put, we put our trust in our military. God says, May, perhaps you should not because I will overthrow them just like that. And he says, I will uh, overthrow their riders. They will fall, each by the sword of his brother. So he's saying he's going to overturn royal thrones. 
He will shatter the power of the kingdoms. He'll overthrow chariots and their drivers and their horses and their riders will fall. Someday, God is going to overthrow all ruling governments on earth. That'll be quite a day, won't it? He will destroy their military because it was that in which the people trusted. So these verses refer to the end of the Great Tribulation period. I'm going to show you how I know. But look carefully at what he's saying in the first couple of verses. God is in control of nature. God is in control of history. He's going to overthrow royal thrones. He will shatter the kingdoms. He will destroy their military power. But this will not happen until the King of Kings comes to earth until Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth which begins the thousand year reign which we call the what? Millennium. Millennium. Millennium is a Greek word meaning thousand. A thousand years. Millennium means thousand years. He will do this not during the tribulation because uh, the Antichrist and his buddies have control of all the kingdoms. But when Jesus comes back, he is going to overthrow all of it. He's going to shatter the military and he will set up his own kingdom on earth. How do I know? Well, let's look at verse 23. Are you with me? Because he gives us the key words. Verse 23, what are the first three words? on that day. So you need to circle them, you need to highlight them, underline them, put them in italics, do whatever you have to do. Because when you see those words in the scriptures, that is a key to you. And it means on that day is on the day that Jesus Christ comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now let me ask you a question. Is that the same time as the rapture, what you and I call the rapture? No, and do not get those confused. The second coming has two parts. The first part is when Jesus appears in heaven, in the heavens, and he calls you and me and my dad and my mom to heaven. He wakes up those who are dead in Christ first, and they rise from their graves wherever they may be, and they, go, they meet Jesus in the air then you and I who are still alive will also ascend into heaven within a twinkling of an eye. That's the first part. That's the first part. The second part, many people say, are seven years later. I don't really know, but we'll th talk about that later. But within a certain amount of time will be the great tribulation. And at the end of that great tribulation, Jesus Christ is coming back to earth on a horse. So see, there are animals in heaven, including my little dog, Shoo Shoo. Okay? So he's coming to heaven. He's going to be wearing a beautiful white robe. And he's going to have a crown that says the King of Kings and Lord of Lords on it. And he's coming back. And guess who's following him? We are. We are. All of those who are in heaven now will come back with him and reign with him. Boy, I hope I get to be a teacher. That's just what I hope. I've told him I want to be a teacher and I want to have a garden with no weeds and enough water, right? Isn't that going to be great? Now, uh, so I think they can say a teacher can assist Jesus Christ in his reign, don't you? I want to teach children to read and I want to teach adults the Bible. So anyway, that was a little bit of a rabbit I chased right there. So on that day, in the scriptures, it's also called the Lord's Day. So write that down in your notes. And so when you go into Zechariah, after you've read Haggai three times this week, listen to me. I hope you go back and read Haggai three times this week because now you know it. And when you get to heaven, you can tell Haggai what you've done. And then we're going to go into Zechariah because in the latter part of Zechariah, you will see these words, on that day, on that day, 
on that day. And you'll say, what day? Well, the scriptures teach us that on that day is the day when Jesus Christ comes back to earth. And he's coming as a judge. You hear me? And we don't want to be part of that judgment. We don't. We've already been gone through our judgment. We've gotten our rewards. Isn't that great? In heaven. He's going to come back as judge and to judge the nations who have persecuted his people or who have helped them. And we will read about that. So verse 23 is on that day. Let's read. Oh, let's look. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. There. The floor is a lot farther down than it used to be. <laughs> My legs have gotten really long in the last several years. It's a lot farther down there. Page 52, letter B. Have we done all of that? No, we haven't. Verse 21. God makes a tremendous promise for the future. Verse 21. Number one, he will once again shake what? The heavens. the heavens and the earth. Revealing that he is in control of what? Amen. And when we see him returning as king of kings and lord of lords, let me tell you the earth is going to shake. And the heavens will shake. And the land and the sea will shake. Because of the power of Jesus Christ coming back. Number two, God will overturn royal thrones. thrones. He will shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. kingdoms. He will destroy their military. military. And that reveals that God is in charge of history. history. Let me tell you something. God is in control. He is the one who even set the boundaries of nations. Did you know that? He is the one who determined that you would be born in the United States of America. And we should say thank you, God. He is the one who is in control of history. Do we understand that? Don't understand it. But he is. And he's got a plan. And he's got a purpose. And you and I want to be part of it, don't we? And so, um, so the, he is in control of history. Verse th number three. Let's look at verse 23 now. We haven't really read that one yet. He's given gives Zerubbabel the signet ring. He says, on that day, what day? The Lord's day. The Lord's day. What's that mean? The what? The end of the great tribulation. He says, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord. So he's going to take she Zerubbabel on that day, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. This seemingly insignificant man was told that he would be given the signet ring, meaning that not him personally, but his descendant would wear the signet ring of the king of Judah. So he knew that his descendant would would be the one who got to sit on the throne. And the Jews knew that the person sitting on that throne would be the Messiah. So he's telling Zerubbabel here that you, Zerubbabel, will be in the direct line of the Messiah. Was that a blessing to him? And I'm going to show you that not only did it happen once, he was in the line twice. So, on that day, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. Remember, God has chosen you as well. On that day refers to the day of the Lord when Jesus comes in what? Judgment. The first time he came, he came in mercy and grace and love. This second time, he's coming in judgment. And he will rule the earth. One day in the future, at the end of the great tribulation, a descendant of Zerubbabel will sit on the throne of David. And we know that because God chose him to wear the signet ring. And this is a message of hope and encouragement, isn't it? To Zerubbabel and to all of the people, the remnant of Judah. What a great 
message this is to them. And they're saying, listen, look to the future. God has a plan for you. He has a program in line for you, and you're right in the middle of it. So this was partially filled 500 years later through two of Zerubbabel's descendants, Mary and Joseph. How many of you knew that Joseph was in the line of Zerubbabel? I didn't. How many of you knew that actually Mary was in the same line of Zerubbabel? Isn't that cool? So look at the next page of, well, wait a minute. Yeah, we'll finish this next week, but look at the next page and I'll show you. Uh, I'll go back to that next week. There, right there, the house of David. And you're going to find, where is my pointer? No, that's my clicker. <laughs> I got a pointer. Here it is, and a clicker. All right, here we go. This was from Just. Where is Justin today? Hi, Jessica. Is your hubby okay? Yeah. All right. Let's, let's go back. Right there. This is the house of David. Now, David was a Jew. The way you prove yourself a Jew is that you have to be a descendant of Abraham. Okay? But Abraham had a lot of sons. So you have to be a descendant not only of Abraham, but of his son Isaac. Isaac was his, his son that God promised him. He was the promised son. And uh, Abraham had Ishmael. They're not Jews. Ishmael is the, the descendant of all the Muslims today. So Abraham has a lot of people in his, in his family. But you have to be a descendant of Abraham and his son Isaac and then his sons um, he had 12 sons and all 12 sons are the Jews all right those are the tribes of Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel and I'm gonna to have to go back teach all this over again next week but uh, it's because people are looking in our door anyway look here David was a Jew he was in the tribe of Judah. And so here is David. Here's his son Solomon. And all of these people are, are uh, descendants of Solomon down to what right there? Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel is in the line of David through Solomon. Look at Luke. We start here with David, but not his son Solomon, his son Nathan. And you just keep going down, 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 down. And then we'll go over here to where? Zerubbabel. And then down here we have Mary. And down here we have Joseph. So we're going to see that Jesus came from the line of... Uh, well, I can't teach anymore. People are going to want in here. Uh, but anyway, that'll, will that give you some meat for this week to look at that? Let's pray right quick. Be yes, ma'am. Yes, come up here and pray for us. Where's my mic? This is Angela. Angela's going to do our prayer for today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our blessed hope that we have in you. Father, I ask that you help us to learn of you and to know the signs that will be coming, Lord. Lord, we rebuke fear of any kind, Lord. We ask that your love surround us and engulf us, Lord, that we will have no fear of what is to come, Lord. We thank you so much for everything that you are doing for us. Heavenly Father, I ask that you help us to get a solid uh, desire to, for lost souls, Heavenly Father, for we know you are coming back and time is short and we want to take all with us if possible, Lord. Father, we just ask that you make us ministers of you, Lord, to the people that we come in contact with and know that you will work through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.